So thanks everyone for uh, coming to listen to about this. Um, I was just going to have a slide that says yes and then leave, basically. But I thought, you know, they had me, you know, speaking for 20 minutes. So there's going to be more here. But I think, you know, the, the question, the, the fact that we sort of phrase it this way and that it's been phrased this way, I think, for the past couple or few years now, really is illustrative of where we are. And uh, these are my disclosures. So I'm going to try to address uh, that question with something of a reasonable answer. There's going to be sort of this outline which appears dry. I'm going to go through uh, some of the data for newer discoveries over the past you know, four to five years to review what that is and how that's changed practice management. But a lot of what I'm going to focus on is concepts and conceptualization. How is it that we conceptualize this disease, both biologically as well as practically in terms of the trials that we've designed, how has that led us to where we are now in terms of the sense of hopelessness or hopefulness? And so then where is the way forward in terms of conceptualization of the disease for what hope there might be? So we're going to, again, talk about how it is that we have historically conceptualized this disease um, and how that has driven forward management practices over the past 10 to 15 years. This will mean focusing then on the data uh, for the time that's present and first line changes and some second line changes and beyond. Um, and then we're going to try to address what hope we might have uh, for the future. Um, and so I think it's fair to say that at this point, we do oftentimes think about squamous cell lung cancer as sort of the other non-small cell lung cancer. And so for those of you who watched TV or read newspapers in the 1980s, you'll remember, I hope, this, for me, memorable ad campaign by the National Pork Producers Council in the United States of trying to get people to eat more pork. And so the ad campaign was pork, the other white meat, and which they sort of had through the 90s and then dropped after it was found to be largely unsuccessful. And the reason why they uh, started this was around 1987, uh, they had noticed that pork consumption, which was sort of in second place behind beef consumption in the United States, was beginning to fall under the threat of chicken consumption. It was projected over the next decade to exceed uh, chicken consumption, uh, or sorry, chicken consumption was projected to exceed pork consumption, again, as the number two spot behind beef in the U.S. In the rest of the world, it's quite popular. Um, so the National Pork Producers Council, there is actually a council called that, it launched a $7 million ad campaign across different media platforms um, and touting it sort of as the other white meat, as the alternative to chicken, which was increasingly becoming popular for health-specific uh, reasons, in part also because it's officially classified by the USDA as red meat. Um, it was largely unsuccessful. If you take a look at the trends in terms of per capita consumption for chicken and pork, you can see quite evidently that over the past 30 years, pork consumption has been relatively flat, about 40 pounds per person. Uh, chicken consumption has nearly doubled over the past uh, 30 years, so pork largely has lost. Um, so the question is, why is it that pork failed? Uh, there's a point to this. I'll get to it in a little bit. Uh, <laughs> And the, sort of the questions are, well, you know, did it fail? Because, it, you know, listen, it's, you're pulling the wool over people's eyes. Clearly, it's an inferior meat in terms of health. So, of course, it was going to fail. People aren't stupid. Or is it actually that that's not the case, that pork actually does have some good attributes compared to chicken? It's just people were unable to be convinced about that. They were sort of stuck in this inertial rut in terms of their pre preconceptions about pork. And so if you take a look at the nutritional context for 100 grams of pork loin and chicken breast, you see the caloric uh, uh, content is about the same. Total fat actually is about the same. Uh, total cholesterol is about the same, and total protein is about the same, which is quite high. And so then the question is, well, okay, if the nutritional content is about the same between the two, then why did it fail? And I think it failed in the United States because of bacon. Uh, because when most people think about pork in the U.S., they think about bacon. When most people think about pork in Korea, I can tell you they also think about bacon. It's a different version, but Koreans also tend to think about bacon. So bacon is the issue, which is sort of the unhealthy part of that heterogeneity that makes up pork. And so I mention this because, for me, this is sort of how we've conceptualized and how sort of viscerally we think about squamous cell lung cancer as kind of the bad version of non-small cell lung cancer. We're in the spectrum of good and bad disease. You have adenocarcinoma clearly on the far right, small cell lung cancer on the left, and squamous cell is somewhere in the middle. And increasingly, a lot of us are sort of thinking that it's really lagging behind lung adenocarcinoma. 
This is for reasons of clinical comorbidities. You know, the classic squamous lung cancer patient tends to be less fit, uh, sort of in our minds, than the classic lung adenocarcinoma patient uh, in terms of cigarette smoking and comorbid conditions. But I think it's important to note that there is real heterogeneity in this disease in terms of the clinical characteristics, in terms of the molecular biology. And so we have to really work with this, keep this in mind, not sort of get stuck with these preconceptions, and to push against that inertia that we have in terms of this sense, I think, of hopelessness. Um, and so again, this is, you know, utilizing the example of pork basically is, is that we need to do a better job of sort of exceeding this in order to get ahead, which the Pork Council failed at, but hopefully will succeed at. And herein, I think, lies the hope, conceptually at least. So we're going to move on to now some information. Uh, so it is quite distinct from lung adenocarcinoma. We know this morphologically. I'm not going to go over the features that make up the classic squamous lung cancer. Uh, we know this immunohistochemically, and these are, of course, macroscopic reflections of the biologic uh, differences. And we know this also in terms of the clinical characteristics, which probably reflect the differing carcinogenic effects that are present between lung adenocarcinomas and uh, at least some of them and squamous cell lung cancers. We know also that they are different, quite different molecularly. We've known this since about 2012, 2011 now. Insofar as you can represent the molecular biology of squamous lung cancer in a pie on the left, the drivers, the putative drivers are very different from the ones that are in adenocarcinoma. And of course, the ones that are actionable are on the right. The ones on the left we'll see, unfortunately, are not actionable. And so it really is that squamous cell lung cancer, I think, is uh, viewed as the non-adenocarcinoma, non-small cell lung cancer. It's odd, I think, is a holdover that we call adenocarcinomas non-squamous. Um, and so management has been driven largely by exclusion, this inertia of a failure. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that in the era of histology-directed therapy in the last decade, squamous cell lung cancer was largely left behind. Angiogenesis inhibition was not approved for it in the form of bevacizumab because of these early perceived risks of life-threatening hemoptysis. Pemetrexid has been an unavailable uh, agent, not for lack of efficacy, but because of that subset analysis uh, from the seminal trial in 2008 showing GEM was a little bit better uh, than pemetrexid in squamous lung cancer patients. And of course, it was completely left behind in the era of targeted therapy that was kickstarted in 2004, where we have a myriad of different options that are available for lung adenocarcinoma patients, all of which are largely uh, unavailable for squamous lung cancer patients. We have tried histology-specific trials, and these have seen modest gains at best, adding, I think, to the sense of inertia. And I've listed some of the, the key ones over the past five years. You'll notice they're all FDA-approved. Many of these are squamous-specific. The hazard ratios for nearly all of them are fairly modest for overall survival, save for the NEVO trial, which we'll get at uh, in a little bit. We are, though, I think, beginning to fill in the gaps. This is the Weinberg uh, Hallmarks of Cancer diagram that I think uh, uh, most people are familiar with in terms of the different avenues of attacking cancers. And where we're beginning to fill in the gaps for squamous lung cancer is in the form of immunosurveillance with immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, which we'll talk about as one of the short-term inroads, I think, for hope in the management of this disease. And of course, what that means is that management is now dictated by upfront pdl one testing for all non-small cell lung cancers. That really sets the pace and the algorithm for what treatments patients are gonna go through. For those who are low expressors, they start with platinum doublet, maybe triplet chemo. Uh, and then for those that are high expressors, they'll start with pembrolizumab in the first line setting. I'll talk briefly about sort of what the standard is now for platinum doublet therapy and some updates that we've seen uh, just to give a flavor again of where it is that the past decade in terms of these chemo trials have uh, led us at the end of the day. So the Squire study was presented uh, a couple years ago and published, uh, which was a first-line randomized study in just squamous lung cancer patients where they got a backbone of cisgem chemo and then a monoclonal antibody against EGFR called nesetumumab given in a weekly fashion, which could then be continued as maintenance therapy. So a fairly straightforward trial. And it was positive. It was a positive study. It had modest benefits in terms of overall survival and PFS. Hazard ratios were about 0.85. Response rates were identical at around 30 percent. Uh, this led to its FDA approval in the first-line setting. They did take a look at pre-specified uh, biomarker uh, studies in terms of protein expression, which we thought would be predictive, but at cut points, any cut point was not predictive of benefit. 
And for fish, it looks like there was a trend towards improvement in benefit in patients who had amplification or high polysomy of uh, the gene. Uh, but again, this was not significant on, on further stratification, but I think it was promising in terms of at least some biomarker that might be able to be used to discriminate whether or not patients uh, might benefit from nesitumumab. But if you compare the regimens in sort of a, a crosstalk comparison, since most of these things have not been compared head to head, you see that the response rates, the PFS, the OS, the tox data are more or less the same. These things really are not all that different from uh, one another at the end of the day. At the end of the day. Uh, so really what we can say, I think, is there is still after 15 years and arguably after 25 years and the introduction of platinum chemotherapy, no standard first-line regimen uh, for these patients of all the different ones that are available, which of course gives us a sense that there's really no hope uh, in the management. Regimen is selected largely by toxicity profiles and no absolute benefit at this point uh, in terms of whether one regimen should be selected over another. This uh, sort of leaks into management of non-IO second line uh, treatment also, uh, which is gonna be the same uh, uh, irrespective of PD-L1 expression. Patients will get to this point at some point. And the updates, of course, are the REVEL trial and also the LUXLUNG-8 trial, uh, which we're not gonna go over in detail. But again, if you do sort of a crosstalk comparison of what the second line options are, it's evident that there are some winners in terms of nivolumab and then added onto that pembrolizumab as well as atezolizumab. And then even docetaxel ramucirumab is, you know, has some additional efficacy, particularly response rate. And then some things that really have tapered off in terms of relotinib and fatinib in terms of any uh, sort of real efficacy in most people. And I think at this point, conceptually, we've been at this point again over the past 15 years where we have tried our best to say, you know, squamous is different from adenocarcinoma. We need to treat them differently. We need to push the horizons. And that's not gotten us very far. I tried to create an asymmetry, but I can't. So on the right side are squamous cell lung cancer patients. And there are agents that are approved also for adenocarcinomas, but for which we think there might be some additional modest benefit in squamous lung cancer patients. But on the left side, you have agents that clearly are better in subsets of patients who have lung adenocarcinomas. So this divisive pull, this strategy to truly try to separate these two out has not been successful. So the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. And so maybe we're, we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should follow where sort of the data have been leading us, which is uh, a sense that maybe instead of this divisive pull, there's this centripetal pull now in the era of immunotherapy, uh, basically collapsing the notion of something that's histology specific uh, with the idea that immunosurveillance, the immune microenvironment, don't have, as far as we know right now, direct correlations with histology, that there are far more important biomarkers than histology like PD-L1, tumor mutation burden, and other undiscovered biomarkers that are there. And practically speaking, that is in fact what has happened. We've seen immunotherapy practically collapse the notion of histology-specific therapy in the management of our patients and also in the clinical trial setups uh, going forward, particularly with IO-IO combinations. Um, for those patients who have PD-L1 expressions that are low, second line, Iotherapy is the standard now, irrespective of histology, and of course it's the standard in the first line setting if your pd one expression is high, uh, whether or not you're a squamous lung cancer patient or a lung adenocarcinoma patient. Um, and this is of course based on the Keynote 24 trial, which uh, you either heard about before or will hear about, I'm sure, later. But again, in brief, it was a frontline randomized trial of pembrolizumab uh, against dealer choice standard of care chemotherapy, depending on histology. It had 20% uh, squamous lung cancer patients. Uh, crossover was allowed in the study, and PFS was the primary endpoint, and we know this, we've seen this many times before. It was a positive study for PFS, OS, and overall response rate, and these differences were not subtle, which quickly led to its FDA approval in October of last year. And uh, the key slide here, again, is that there is benefit uh, in terms of PFS for both squamous and non-squamous patients. That sort of trend towards better improvement favoring squ uh, squamous patients in, in terms of pembrolizumab, I think is a little bit of an artifact in terms of um, the chemo options that were available since maintenance PEM could be given, which we know improves PFS. Uh, and so you see that there's an inverse uh, pattern for PEM-containing chemo regimens on the bottom. So again, I don't think this data says there's anything inherently uh, about squamous lung cancer that means they're more sensitive to immunotherapy. I think it's just, again, uh, this uh, sort of um, artifact of the trial. I'm not gonna go over the specific data for the three IO-approved agents, uh, 
uh, safe to put them side by side and to note that they are all approved in non-small cell lung cancer. They differ by the assay that was used in their development, by whether or not PD-L1 expression is required for approval, as in the case of pembrolizumab, um, and also uh, some differences in terms of frequency of administration. There are some things that we don't know, that we need to know, though, uh, and hopefully we will get to know, and one is that there's no established connection between the squamous lung cancer genomic subsets and response to IO. This would be nice to know. Uh, the other is that there's no established difference between IO and non-small cell lung cancer histologic subtypes. Again, the idea is that they're effective in both. We don't yet know, say for NEVO, if there's a finer interaction between histology and pd one expression. For Pembro and Atezo, as those data have not yet been presented, uh, but for now, doesn't there doesn't appear to be a difference in terms of what was presented? And of course, there's more to come. And in terms of the short term, this is the short term hope: are the slew of, in particular, first line trials of IO 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 chemo combinations to see whether or not this might be able to move the bar finally to something that really is the standard treatment in the first line setting, um, as well as IO IO combinations in the second line setting and beyond to sort of introduce other options. Because at the end of the day, despite the fact that IO has been great, it has added exactly one line of therapy to the management and no more, irrespective of what your PD-1 expression is. So the onus is on us to really try to find other treatments to add to that armamentarium. So we've seen hope from immunotherapy. I am going to wrap up now a little bit on what about targeted therapy. So the reality, is that, again, insofar as we can show the targets in a pie uh, for FGFR1 amplification, upstream PI3 kinase aberrations, and G1S checkpoint alterations, our trial efforts have failed. Uh, we have readouts now from phase one expansion studies and phase two studies for many FGFR1 inhibitors, a couple of PI3 kinase inhibitors, and a G1S checkpoint inhibitor, and the, uh, the efficacy is, is fairly modest, and there really is no development pathway forward for monotherapy uh, for these things. And in terms of trying to answer, you know, why is it that things haven't worked out? Why is it that we haven't seen better benefits? I think one way to get at this is to ask is whether or not our approach, again, conceptually is just wrong, whether or not the distillation of the complexity that's in the disease into a pie actually makes any kind of sense. And it might not, because we know in terms of the oncoprints uh, for these patients that the genomic alterations are quite complicated for these patients. And it could be that the genomic alterations themselves, conceptualizing the disease that way, is not the right approach either. That maybe gene expression profiles are going to be more meaningful in terms of predicting response to targeted therapies or proteomics as well um, as an option. Um, and we've seen some of this in terms of preclinical sort of trials, and this is data presented by our colleague Peter Hammerman a few years ago, four years ago, uh, where he took a panel of CCLE uh, cell lines, uh, did gene expression profiling uh, that was already extant, parsed them out as best he could into the different uh, expression subtypes that we know about for squamous lung cancer, and then tried to figure out whether or not efficacy of drugs, both targeted as well as chemo, parsed out by this. And there was some parsing out that was present. It was not perfect, but a proof of principle is there at least in terms of being able to use this as a biomarker selection platform instead of sequencing uh, to select out patients for targeted therapies. And so for me, I think this is the final slide. This is where the hope is. The hope is sort of in terms of short-term things like I talked about for immunotherapy and then longer-term hopes. Um, in terms of this Venn diagram. So there are, I think, new genomic targets that we've not talked about that we're actively doing research on in terms of NFE202 keep one mutations, SOX2 amplification. There are new methods of um, target identification that are getting better in terms of gene expression profiling and proteomics on FFPE, which I think would be one way forward uh, to try to identify patients for targeted therapies. Uh, we have not yet done this, but doing combination targeted therapy trials uh, for patients uh, I think makes plenty of sense. I think it is a lot to ask to do this in terms of a, a sort of classic phase two study, but I think because the alterations are so different, but I think doing these things in a sensical approach on a per patient basis uh, might yield um, dividends, uh, as well as combinations of these things with chemotherapy, which we know uh, might also add benefit. And then finally, this notion not only of IO-IO combinations, 
but of looking at genomic alterations through the lens of how they impact the immune microenvironment and so how they might be able to affect the efficacy of immunotherapy as a backbone also in terms of trial designs moving forward, which some of us are working on also. And that's it.